Socks are big business. And it's not just because of their near supernatural ability to go missing in the wash. Worldwide, the industry is worth $20 billion. The biggest sock lovers are Germans, who on average buy 13 pairs each a year. Today's socks employ groundbreaking technology that does everything from keeping us warm to stopping our feet from smelling. How do they do it? Cape Town, South Africa. This beautiful oceanside city is famous for sharks and surfing. But away from the tourist trail, business is booming for one of the city's lesser known industries. The Falca factory is one of Africa's biggest sock makers. In this one building, they make 32,000 pairs every single day. The man in charge is Martin Grobola. A sock is definitely not just a tube of fabric. There's a lot of engineering and science that goes into a sock. Socks have been keeping our feet warm for centuries, at least since Roman times. The oldest known pair were found in a 1,600-year-old tomb. Archaeologists believe they're the first recorded evidence of a classic fashion faux pas, socks with sandals. Making the modern sock poses a host of challenges for designers. It has to be curved to match the natural shape of the foot, absorb moisture and odour, and it all has to come together without scratchy seams that could irritate sensitive feet. At the Falca factory, head designer Byron Kunrad works out the clever stuff. I would come up with ideas to, to make a sock, and then I will then put it in the machine program. The computer design specifies pattern and the mix of materials to be used. Cotton gives comfort and breathability to socks for daily wear, while Lycra adds flexibility to sports socks. With the design locked, the program converts them into patterns that can be read by the factory's computerized knitting machines. The physical sock starts out as a roll of yarn. And unless you want your socks in stylish white, this yarn has to be dyed. Anand Krishna is the king of colour who oversees the process. We are here in the dye house where we do all the colouring of the different yarns. Dyeing takes place in pressurised containers at up to 130 degrees Celsius. At this temperature, the fibres can open and absorb the dye particles. After a minimum of six hours, the newly colourful yarns emerge. Bright red for when you're feeling brave. This would get dried and then goes into the knitting production. The yarns go onto one of 340 computerized knitting machines on the shop floor. The high-tech machines cost $35,000 a piece. They reproduce Byron's designs perfectly. Each one can make 120 pairs a day. The tricky thing about knitting socks is forming a tube shape with no uncomfortable seams. These machines get around the problem by knitting in a circle, building up the threads layer by layer to form a hollow tower that eventually becomes the tube. All right, everything OK? Yep. Right. For knitting floor manager Kenneth Smith, the scale and complexity of sock production can cause a few headaches. In this room, we manufacture 32,000 pairs a day. In the sock, we have nylons, we have cotton, polyesters, and even elastics. It's complicated. Getting the elastic in the wrong place would make for saggy socks. But the computer-controlled machines never drop a stitch. However, at this point, the socks are still a little drafty. Oh, the toes is open, so we must sew the toes. The linking process sorts that out. The toe end of each sock is placed onto the teeth of a specialised sewing machine. It's a tricky job that has to be done by hand for every single sock. Steady fingers place each stitch. Then the machine sews the sides of the toe end together with a single thread. The hands-on touch makes a more durable and comfortable sock. Susan Josephs is the queen of the needle. 
But even for her, the job isn't easy. Your eyes must be very good if you do linking. Because linking is very, very sensitive. These socks are finished. But the strange thing about new socks is that they look like they've just escaped from the laundry basket. This is what the sock looks like before it is formed. They fix this problem with a giant steamer and a moving row of metal feet. We do the steaming chamber, which is 110 degrees for about 15 seconds. The heat reshapes the socks to make them foot-shaped. The sock will come out like this. It will now keep this position. So this is a finished product now. The completed product is put into pairs, packed and stacked, ready to disappear mysteriously in washing machines worldwide. Blackcurrant Ribena is one of the top-selling drinks in the UK. More than six million bottles quench Britain's thirst every week. But when it comes to making the famous fruity drink, how do they do it? When you think about what kept Britain going during World War II, it might not be the humble blackcurrant. In 1941, U-boats were torpedoing boatloads of oranges from overseas that British kids relied on for vitamin C. British weather meant homegrown oranges weren't an option. What Britain did have were black currants. Kilo for kilo, they have four times as much vitamin C as oranges. To help keep kids healthy, the British government decided to offer children a black currant cordial called Ribena for free. It still comes from British black currants grown at farms like this one in Herefordshire. Black currant grower James Wright is ready for the harvest. Here we are today, and you can see all the fruit has gone jet black. So there's some lovely, lovely fruit on there. 90% of all the UK's black currants will end up in a bottle of Ribena. But picking 400 tons from these bushes is not a job you can tackle by hand. The custom-built black currant harvester makes short work of it. As it rolls over the rows of fruit, rotating spokes gently shake the berries off the bush and onto a conveyor. The conveyors go up to the back of the machine. We have some extraction fans which cleverly suck out all the leaves and twigs um, so that we only end up with black currants coming along the conveyor and falling into these half-ton bins. Now for the juicy bit. Squashing hundreds of tons of berries is no easy task. And there's no such thing as a purpose-built blackcurrant squasher. Help comes from the cider makers of England's West Country. Cider apples won't ripen till autumn, so during summer, this cider press has a little time to squash something different. Manager Mark Beresford oversees the process. We'll have around about 500 tonne delivered per day, so we're running 24 hours a day, seven days a week. A forklift dumps the berries into a tank by the boxful. The sticky fruit is tricky to transport, so a giant Archimedes screw carries the black currants up into the factory, where the rollers split the skin to release the juice inside. The liquid black currant mash is now piped to a row of powerful presses for the big squeeze. Each of these five giant rotating drums contains 14 tons of berry mash, but the mix is still full of skin. The press gets rid of the unwanted stuff by forcing the mix through tubular sieves called filter socks. There's 288 of these which run from front to back. All they simply are is a, a cloth filter. As the press squeezes, the juice is forced through the sock we're leaving the solids behind on the outside. For two hours, the blackcurrant juice flows out of the press. The juice press from June until August must make a year's supply, and that means it needs to be stored. Before it can be transported, it's reduced in volume to a concentrate. The blackcurrant juice is heated in steel tanks. 
this boils off the water, reducing its weight and volume by 80%. But the problem is, the flavour is boiled away. Mixed in with the steam are chemicals called aroma volatiles, which give blackcurrants their flavour. So to save these precious aromas, some of the steam is siphoned off into separate tanks and condensed. It comes off as a clear liquid, and it'll give you all the smells you associate with a blackcurrant. So this needs to be added back into the product at a later date in order to give you all the flavour that you want. From June through August, three tankers a day are loaded with concentrate. They travel an hour to the factory in Colford, Gloucestershire. By the end of the blackcurrant season, it has enough concentrate to last the entire year. And with no more berries coming till next June, you don't want this lot going off. Luckily, below the factory is a giant cold store, keeping the juice cool at 10 degrees Celsius. Mark Holford is in charge. We've actually got 90 tanks, 19,000 litres per tank, so the potential for 1.7 million litres of blackcurrant concentrate. In this state, the stockpile of concentrate is way too sour to drink. To turn it into a bottle you can enjoy, it's recombined with the aroma liquid, sugar and other sweeteners to create blackcurrant syrup. Chris Hobbs oversees the final blending. We've got syrup in this tank, water in this tank over here. We mix them together at a set ratio of water to syrup all the time to maintain product quality. Now the syrup tastes great, but unfortunately, it's attractive to bacteria. A bit of heat sorts that out in a process known as pasteurization. We heat it up to above 94 degrees as a, a heated treatment and then cool it back down to around 10 to 14 degrees ready for bottling. 36,000 bottles are filled every hour. A cap and shrink fit sleeve seal them up and the blackcurrant squash is ready to roll. An old-fashioned favourite, quenching thirst the world over.